All right, I'm gonna kick us off here. Um, hello, and thank you everyone. Welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, also known as CCAST. My name is Carly. I am a conservation biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the at-risk species coordinator for CCAST. And anyone unfamiliar with CCAST, um, we are a peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange platform, uh, and we hope to support the co-production of decision support tools on key management challenges, such as introduced aquatic species that we'll talk a little bit more about today. CCAST supports different communities of practice, including our non-native aquatic species community of practice, which we launched in May of 2020. If you would like more information on CCAST or our communities of practice, please feel free to email myself or Matt Graybaugh. And as soon as I'm done with the welcome here, I'll go ahead and drop those emails into the chat. And to get us started, uh, this is kind of different than our usual uh, kickoff of the webinar here, but CCAST is in the process of changing our name. And the hope is that our new name will really continue to kind of retain the spirit of working in partnership on natural resource management and conservation while being more easily recognizable and unique from some of the other existing similar sounding acronyms. And so we've narrowed it down to a pretty short list, and we're actually hoping to elicit your help in selecting a new name. So in just a moment, you will see a poll pop up, and I'm hoping that folks can choose the name that you feel like best represents CCAS based on your experience. So let me launch this poll here. And let's go ahead and take, you know, maybe 30 seconds. Um, please feel free to choose whichever name again that you feel like best represents CCAST based on your experience with us. I can, I'll read those out loud too, just as we're kind of voting on them in real time, but we have conservation and adaptation toolbox, adaptation and conservation toolbox, <laughs> just switching the words around there, um, conservation and adaptation resources, adaptation and conservation resources, and finally, Conservation and Adaptation Resources Toolbox. Awesome. I'm gonna let that roll for maybe just another 10 seconds. Looks like we're about at 70% participation. So thanks folks for chiming in on a new name here. We appreciate it. Okay, wonderful. I'm gonna go ahead and end that. Thank you everyone who participated. I really appreciate it. Looks like just off the cuff here, um, most votes were for Conservation and Adaptation Resources Toolbox, or CART. So I'm going to go ahead and end that. Um, that isn't the end-all be-all for this um, new name choice. We are going to fly that again on another one of our webinars um, and kind of make a decision based off that. But let's jump back into why we're here today. And so this webinar and webinars are just one of the ways that CCAST kind of helps facilitate peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. And we are super excited to host a presentation from Trevor Shuffles and Robin Reeder King, who are going to talk about lessons learned from the first three year long, excuse me, lessons learned in the first three years of a long-term invasive American bullfrog removal effort at Convoy Lake National Wildlife Refuge. So Trevor Shuffles has worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the National Wildlife Refuge System since 2013 and has been the refuge manager at Convoy Lake National Wildlife Refuge since 2016. He has been involved in aquatic invasive species work in the Pacific Northwest since his graduate program at Portland State University, where he studied the invasive nutria. 
And Robin Reeder King is a biological technician for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at Conway Lake National Wildlife Refuge. She has been the lead for bullfrog eradication projects since its beginning in 2020. Robin actually started working at Conway Lake in 2019 as an AmeriCorps. And Robin received her bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley, where she majored in integrative biology. So a quick final reminder before I turn it over to our presenters, if you have any questions during the presentation, please enter those in the chat box and I will relay them to the speakers after the presentation. And with that, Trevor, Robin, we're ready for your presentation. All right, thanks Carly. Hi everyone, hope you're doing well today. Sorry. Yeah, so I uh, am a little bit ill-prepared today. I uh, am doing it from a different location and don't have my dual screen, so I can't see anything except the full screen presentation. So Carly, feel free to uh, jump in if we need to pause for any reason. Can so just you? enough here. Uh, I just want to do some acknowledgments to our project partners. I won't be able to read through all these, but uh, there are a lot of phases of this project, um, a lot of which we won't talk about today. But a few things to highlight, the, the list down the left-hand side there, all the field technicians have been doing all the hard work out in the field there. And then on the right side in the box, a lot of uh, fellow refuge folks in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that contribute to the project. So we thank you for to everyone for help making this happen. In the background there, you can't see it very well, but that's Mount Adams. Conway Lake Refuge is in South Central Washington State uh, to orient folks who haven't been there before. So here's my little sports analogy or starting lineups on the, on the home team. We have the Oregon Spotted Frog. This is the main reason we're launching this project. And the uh, Oregon Spotted Frog was federally listed as threatened in 2014. Convoy Lake Refuge is uh, home to formerly the largest population throughout the entire species range. So very important site uh, for recovery of the species. And then obviously the American bullfrog, um, considered one of the 100 worst invaders in the world. I'm uh, making the assumption that uh, most folks know uh, quite a bit about bullfrogs, so I won't go through the full life history. But uh, they've been present in the Glenwood Valley where the refuge is located since the 1950s. They were intentionally introduced and uh, within the last 10, 15 years seem to have had an expanding population. So the goal of this project is to remove all the bullfrogs. I've got it uh, there in the lower left, and you'll actually see that on several of the slides, just as a symbolic way to kind of remind myself and, and all of us that that is the goal of the project. Uh, being clear up front, you know, some projects may have control as a goal. Uh, we're trying to remove all the bullfrogs. And so everything we do is, is seen through that filter. A little more background on the Oregon spotted frog. Uh, we have a quickly changing situation. In 2017 uh, and into 2018, we saw a huge reduction in the amount of irrigation water coming uh, to the lower part of the Glenwood Valley. And so that has uh, correlated with uh, quickly decreasing Oregon spotted frog population. You can see we do annual egg mass surveys in 2016-17. Uh, we were at about 1,200 egg masses and then quickly declined uh, to a low point of less than 150 egg masses in 2021. So that's almost a 90% decline in only five years. And for uh, several years, we were seeing 60 to 40% annual declines. The past egg mass survey season was the first year we stabilized. So we're hopeful that uh, the bullfrog work is, is stabilizing our spotted frog population. So a few reasons why we think this project can be successful. It's an ambitious project, but uh, we do have large financial investment. Uh, we saw the quickly climbing spotted frog population, knew we needed to remove all the stressors we could, and a primary one being bullfrogs. So we applied for and were successful in getting a large million dollar grant from Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to initiate this project and fund the first five years of it. So we do have a large uh, financial commitment, which has been key. We're in an isolated watershed. The red line there shows watershed boundaries. And this is a large area. If we did uh, map the minimum convex polygon around where we're finding bullfrogs, we're probably looking at 10 to 12,000 acres, um, but limited habitat within that. You can see a lot of linear features uh, in blue there. And there are physical boundaries on all sides of the refuge. 
uh, to the west there. Let's see if my highlight function will work on my. No, not quite. But if you can see my cursor um, just peeking out to the very left of the screen there, you can see the edge of the Trout Lake Valley. That is uh, just five miles away to the west, similar valley, similar elevation, uh, has never had any documented bullfrogs. And so uh, we think there's a good barrier there, similar barriers, uh, terrain, high elevation on other sides. And then to the east, where the drainage empties into the Klickitat River, there is a 70-foot waterfall just upstream and very steep canyon walls. So we, we do think we have an isolated watershed, which is why we're trying to remove all bullfrogs instead of just to control because we don't think new individuals are coming into the watershed. We have refuge or access on and off refuge in the transparent green there refuge properties, uh, but we're working with a lot of private landowners as well off refuge so not just restricted to our ownership. And then we have water control on a lot of our wetland units ability to manipulate water levels. I'll highlight one there that's circled in the upper right. That's the mill pond, not on refuge, but owned by our partner, Mount Adams Resource Stewards. And that's uh, gonna be a key part of the story, which is why I wanted to highlight it right off the bat here. So a little bit about natural history of bullfrogs. Uh, it takes several years for bullfrogs to go from egg mass stage to reproductive adult size. And so based on both what we see in the literature and also experience from other eradication and or control efforts folks we've talked with our strategy is to focus here on our metamorph juvenile and adult life stages uh, it's not realistic to be able to re remove all individuals from all the life stages and so we focus there uh, to cut off breeding and also those are the life stages that are surface active so this talk mostly focuses on those last two life stages and and not much on tadpoles and egg masses So this is a quick summary of the field team we have uh, with that funding I mentioned previously. It's six, te six technicians, they work in pairs. One is a hunting technician and a standard biotechnician. The main difference being that the hunting technicians have experience with air rifles and the ability to use those as a control method. We, we've been working May through October, so six months of the year, a full time, five nights a week, and predominantly hunting at night. They do some, some day work, but mostly working at night. And I mentioned uh, Mount Adams Resource Stewards, who owns the mill pond. They also are the organization that we hired the crew through and uh, have been an amazing partner for us. And just, uh, I don't know if we have any current or former crew members on the on this presentation or not on the call, but uh, just want to thank everyone for all the hard work they've put in the field to make it happen so far. So, I'm jumping ahead here uh, to some results, but I, I wanted to highlight a couple of slides to show you some of the ways we're using data we're collecting to inform that crew and how they're working out in the field. We're working the biostatistician. So this is an example. This is just looking at adults, but we're looking at uh, basically the probability of capturing any adults on a hunt through time. So you can see a really standard um, bell curve there. And we see in the midsummer months, we're much more likely to be capturing adults. So that's that's good information to know. And we can also look at that in terms of how long we should be on the field. I should mention it, the title there says hunt duration. A hunt is defined as uh, a particular event at a certain site on a certain night. So there, there could be many hunts on one night at, at different sites. But we look at that also in terms of you know, how long we should be out in the field. So if we look at the blue line there, that'd be a hunt duration of one hour. And you see in the shoulder seasons, it's pretty similar to that red line, which would be a hunt of 90 minutes, adding an extra half hour on. So uh, not much difference, but in the middle of the summer there, you can see uh, if we stay out 30 minutes longer, we increase our likelihood of capturing adults by about 10% from 30% to 40%. And so we use these types of metrics to, to help guide our team and, and how long they should be on the field, where they should be, uh, depending on the time of year. And we look at uh, metrics specific to juveniles as well. So this is a slide based on juveniles. You can see in the left graph there, we're looking at the impact of cloud cover, you know, adjusting for date, hour and temperature, so just cloud cover 
and you can see a linear decrease in uh, the number of juveniles we capture as we get more cloud cover. And then another way to look on it on the right there is the proportion of moon illuminated. So looking at the moon phase, you can see the brighter the moon is, the more juveniles we get and up to a point, and then it kind of flattens out. But, you know, we use these types of metrics to look at if it's a new moon and a really, really cloudy night, we're not likely to get a lot of juvenile frogs. So let's focus the crew on sites, you know, that are more focused on adults rather than juveniles. And so these are the types of data driven decisions we're trying to make based on what we've learned so far. To look at it visually, this is an example from 2020, uh, getting into some summary results here. I know you probably won't be able to read that full legend. That's okay. You can just kind of see different colors representing different relative densities of bullfrogs removed and how we, we split up linear segments of the channels uh, to try to look at it in as much spatial detail as we can. And then on the right, um, here's a summary, just the first three years, total numbers except for tadpoles of how many frogs we've removed. So two things that I noticed when I look at that chart is it's a lot of frogs, you know, anywhere from just under 11,000 to almost 30,000 frogs a year, excluding tadpoles. So a lot of frogs removed. And then secondly, that huge spike in 2021, uh, we've highlighted in orange there, the number of uh, frogs that were from the mill pond late in the season. And just a reminder, that's where that site is located. Uh, but 18,000, more than well, more than half the frogs from that year came from that one site uh, towards the end of the field season. And so that's the big difference with 2021. And the reason for that is water management. So this is, a, I think, a really good example highlighting how important the ability to manage water levels can be uh, at a site where you're controlling bullfrogs. So this is that mill pond site, just a portion of it, but to about 25 acre reservoir. We worked with our partner to draw it down in late September 2021 and expose 25 acres of mud flats that look just like this and expose just thousands of frogs with dropping the water out. So you can see with this graph you know, over time how many frogs we removed from the mill pond. And then at that September 21st date, you can see a huge increase in number of frogs in that uh, about one month period, we removed more than 17,000 frogs from just this site. They were just, the mud flats were just crawling with juveniles and, and exposed metamorphs, mostly metamorphs actually. 86% of what we caught um, looked pretty similar to this photo uh, with, you know, frogs developing between the tadpole and, and the froglet stage. And so that effort was hugely successful in efficiently targeting frogs at the the main breeding site in the valley. I think I failed to mention that uh, Mill Pond is a prime bullfrog breeding area in the valley. So that was a really successful effort. And from here, I will pass it on to Robin to, to talk some more about some of the, the seasonality power, patterns of how we're doing the removal. Thanks, Trevor. So three seasons of field work has given us a great idea of which methods uh, we should use to most efficiently remove frogs. And this is largely dependent on life stage, which is influenced by time of year. So what we learned is that in the spring, we target early emerging adults. Uh, and then in spring to early, late spring to early summer, we start to target breeding adults. And we have experienced that shooting is the most effective method for targeting and removing adults. Uh, particularly 177 and 22 caliber air rifles, and also wary individuals. And then as the breeding season starts to wind down in the summer, we start to transition to hand capture as the dominant removal method. And this really effectively targets uh, surface active juveniles and metamorphs. And then as we transition to fall, uh, we take advantage of the lower water levels across the valley and isolated pools of which we use fike and or seine nets to remove early stage metamorphs and tadpoles. So this uh, chart shows, these pie charts show that after three seasons, 
we started to notice changes in the population demographics, which influences which removal methods we use. So here you can see uh, these pie charts starting to tell the story of how we're catching less large adults since the beginning of the project and now starting to catch more bullfrogs of younger life stages. And you can see this by the incremental decrease in shooting across years and the increase in hand capture and netting. And then in this next slide, this graph nicely shows what we've been observing in the field in terms of adult seasonality. So June and July, all three seasons uh, have been the peak breeding months at Convoy and when adults are most conspicuous. Now you'll note that in 2022, we caught the most adults in August and that was due to a very late and wet spring we had last year which push back the breeding season about a month. When the breeding season starts to wind down, the adults sightings drop significantly and they're actually pretty hard to find after that. And one last thing I wanna mention on this slide is that 2022 last season was uh, pretty interesting in, the, in some changes we observed in the adult population. A lot of the adult males we were catching that were calling in the field were physically expressing the yellow chin and large tympanum characteristics of a mature male. However, they were notably smaller in terms of snout to vent length than males caught in previous years. So we're still looking at this data, but one thought we have is that since we heavily targeted uh, large adult males in the first two years, that decreased pressure on younger males may have given them the opportunity to mature more quickly than they otherwise would have. Here you can see that we observe and therefore catch very few subadults until after the breeding season has finished. And that has been true um, across all seasons. The large spike that you see in 2021 uh, is again due to the mill pond as Trevor um, discussed. And one last thing I wanna point out here is that the in last season in 2022, we observed more overlap between the juvenile and adult life stages uh, than in previous years. And that's likely due to the wet spring we had that delayed the adult breeding season. So uh, data collection for this project has always consisted of a two-pronged approach, good data collected in the field and data collected or data entered back in the lab. So <laughs> it seems like a long time ago now, but back in 2020, the first season of the project, we were using paper data sheets to collect field data and entering morphometric data in a Microsoft Access database in the lab. The field data uh, had consisted of two uh, components, the hunt metadata and summary data. And the hunt metadata has remained pretty consistent over the course of, uh, over the years. And we take measurements on you know, start, and, start and end times, weather data, stuff like that. And the summary data we collected in 2020 were, was total number of bullfrogs caught versus seen and total number of spotted frogs observed. And then back in the lab, uh, we would take individual morphometrics on each frog, which included snout to vent length, wet weight, uh, life stage, and gender if we were able to. So recording uh, the hunt ID, which was a combination of the site name and date that was recorded on the paper data sheet, uh, allowed us to relate this morphometric summary data back to specific hunts. In 2021, uh, we made three big changes. The first was collecting field data digitally, so using ArcGIS Collector. 
And second, that then allowed us to collect spatial locations for individual frogs. And third, we created ID tags for captured frogs that allowed us to assign them individual codes. Now, combining these two uh, pieces of data from collector to Microsoft Access required a lot more technical work behind the scenes, um, but we're not going to get into that today. So as you can see, the hunt metadata, uh, as I said before, has stayed pretty consistent in terms of what um, metrics we're, we're recording. Uh, what largely changed was the individual data. So we were now able to collect spatial GPS locations on individual frogs uh, instead of just summary data. And back in the lab, we were still collecting individual morphometrics for each frog but now we were able to connect that morphometric data from each frog to a GPS location of where it was actually caught. And uh, as you might imagine, it's pretty hard to actually temporarily mark frogs. So we tested a bunch of different options, but as you'll see in that, uh, from that, that frog on the scale in that picture, uh, we settled on a Velcro band, which we write the ID in Sharpie on and attach it to the frog in the field. Before the 2022 field season, we were really trying to reduce the number of different platforms we were using to collect and store data. Because most of the data for this project has a spatial component, we decided to look for AGOL applications that could replace MX, MS Access for data entry back in the lab. We discovered two applications that fit our needs, Sidebar and Experience Builder. Furthermore, the workflow with these applications closely mirrors our workflow in 2021. So I will give a short demonstration of Experience Builder now, as which you can see before you. So if I came back from a night of hunting bullfrogs, I would first sync my data from field maps to a GOL. Once that data was synced, I would open up this application experience builder. And this is what I would first see. This is the same map that is in field maps and where the crew was collecting data in the field. And all of these yellow stars represent bullfrogs caught in the 2022 field season. So in this upper uh, portion of the screen, I will enter, well, I will filter by the date I caught my frog. So let's say I was hunting in September and started my hunt on September 7th. So I want to filter for that date. And this is a really nice feature of Experience Builder. Once I set that filter, the map uh, zooms and only shows bullfrogs caught on September 7th. So then I have two options. I can one, either pan to the area where I was hunting in and click one of the yellow stars, or if, since I have the frog in front of me that has the Velcro tag on it with the tag ID number, I can go to this upper left portion of the screen and search for my tag ID. So let's say my initials were AD and this number represents the hour, minute, and seconds the time the frog was caught. That is the correct one that co uh, corresponds to the Velcro tag on the frog in front of me. So I will click this tag ID. Again, the map will zoom in to the exact location that frog was caught. So that's another really nice check to make sure that uh, you are entering data on the correct frog. Then I will confirm the selection in step two on the left here. And then in this third box below, this edit box, this is where the technicians uh, will enter morph metrics for each frog. So as you can see, we make sure that the tag ID corresponds to steps two and one above. And these would normally be empty if I was first entering morph metrics. But 
Uh, same as in previous years, we are entering uh, data for total length, SVL, wet weight, gender, and life stage. And once I've entered the, that data, I'd update uh, the point and all of that data would be stored in Experience Builder and in the map. So whereas in 2021, that morphometric data was entered in MS Access and needed to be connected to the AGOL layers, this workflow eliminates that extra step and stores all of the data in the map where we can more easily visualize the data and produce quick real-time summaries, as I will show in the next slide. Just so, to jump in really quickly, it looks like some yeah. folks were unable to see some of the progression on that video. Sorry about that, y'all. We tried to troubleshoot before we got on here and we're seeing videos, but um, hopefully we'll be able to talk through some way to maybe be able to see these um, data collection entries and how that works. We'll see if the next video works. Yeah. So did that not work for you either, Carly? Not this time. Hmm. Well, I can try the next one or I could stop sharing and reshare again real quick to see if that solves it. It did work fine in our test. Let's let's do a quick check on the next one and then maybe we can in real time stop sharing and resharing. All right. So after we have entered data in the field into field maps and gone back to the lab and edited that data using Experience Builder, we can then start to work with that complete data set using a dashboard. An AGOL dashboard really nicely visualizes data collected on most AGOL applications. To create this dashboard, we first added the Bullfrog map and its associated layers so we could then build different elements that would transform tabular data into summary charts and graphs. These graphs automatically update as new data is uploaded in the associated layers. So now let's take a quick look at some of the metrics we followed throughout the 2022 season. Here in the top right is our map. And if we expand this, we have a lot of uh, cool ways we can interact with this map. So we can open the layers tab and toggle on and off any layers we want to see or not want to see and take a deeper dive into what we do want to see. So I've toggled off all layers except for the bullfrog points, which are represented in these yellow stars. And so we can get a general sense of what's going on in the valley, or we can really zoom in. And if we're looking for a particular frog, we can even click on a star and it'll pull up. Well, it'll either pull up the relevant information for the unit, or it'll pull up the information collected for that specific frog. Over here on the left, we have the number of bullfrogs caught that had an associated GPS location. So this map only represents the frogs that were entered into field maps and have an individual GPS location, which represents about 40% of the total number of frogs caught in 2022. So keep in mind that the rest of these graphs and charts are only representing that 40%. So here in the bottom left, uh, we like to look at anything and everything. We like to look at total bullfrogs caught in each unit. And this just gives us a quick idea of where we're catching a lot of frogs and where which units we're really catching very little. So this year it seems you know obvious that Trove Ponds Private caught a lot of frogs and we caught very few on the Mount Adams Highway ditch. We also like to look at where the team is hunting frequently and infrequently. So again, here you can see that Mill Pond was hunted very frequently this season, whereas Tro Pond's ditch was hunted very rarely. We also like to look at uh, the ratios of life stage that we're catching, and this will change as the data is updated. 
So this pie chart will actually change substantially over the course of one season. For example, in the 2022 season, in May and June, the adult slice of this pie chart dominated the chart. But uh, come August, we were catching many more juveniles, and so the chart started to change. Lastly, we're also curious about how bullfrogs and the bullfrogs we're catching change in size over time. So one metric we use to measure that is snout to vent length. And so with the data we collect, we're able to keep track of how the snout to vent length changes uh, with the frogs we've caught over the course of one season. In the bottom right are just a few more metrics that we keep track of. We like to keep track of how catch how the methods we're using to catch bullfrogs change over time. Uh, so for example, you can see that hand catching and shooting uh, spiked in August. We also like to look at how the metadata uh, interacts with the, the bullfrog data. And so here we created a, a graph that shows the number of bullfrogs caught uh, in at various temperatures. More generally, we also like to keep track of the number of bullfrogs caught per month. And I really like this chart because it keeps track of which catch methods we're using the most in which unit, which actually varies a lot and varies over time. So for example, in Tropons Private, majority of the frogs that we caught, we caught by hand, whereas in the mill pond, the majority we caught were by shooting. Dashboards is a really great tool to summarize and visualize incoming data in real time and has significantly helped inform high level decision making and data driven science for this project. Quick check Did that one come through okay Carly I assume. That one came through perfectly, thank you. All right. Since the overall goal of this project is to Since the overall goal of this project is to conserve the Oregon spotted frog, we thought it only fair to give it its own dashboard. The bullfrog removal team has been collecting data since 2020 on spotted frogs they observe in the field while they're hunting bullfrogs. They record the location of each individual as well as the life stage if they're able to. And just as in the bullfrog dashboard, this data updates as new data comes in each night from the team and really helps direct higher level decision making in real time. So some of the metrics we like to keep track of during the field season, I'll show you now. Obviously, the first component that we always like to look at is the map. And if we expand it right now and view the different layers, uh, we can toggle on and off layers we want to see or don't want to see. So right now, uh, we can toggle off the individual point layers and just view an overall heat map of where spotted frog concentrations are highest across the valley. But if we turn that layer back on, we can more closely examine individual spotted frogs observed in the units. Another feature we like to keep track of are total number of frogs observed. Uh, so this was the total for the 2022 season. Please keep in mind that this does not equate to the total number of spotted frogs in, in the valley as we survey units repeatedly throughout the week and likely count the same individuals uh, weekly. Uh, something else we like to look at is for, you know, ratios of life stage. So this season we saw a lot more subadults than adults across the valley. We also look at percent by site. So this depicts all of the sites that spotted frogs were observed. And if we wanted to take a look, closer look at any site, say Convoy Lake, which looks like it had the highest number of sightings 
this season. We can click on this slice and if you noticed the map zooms in to that, to that unit in the valley. Over here in the bottom right, uh, we keep track of live stage by site. And since we do cover a lot of units, uh, different units throughout the valley, this uh, slider feature is really nice because you can zoom in on different parts or different individual units and look at the ratios from here. So Convoy Lake again, we observed far more subadults than adults in that unit. And lastly, just to get an overall picture of what we're seeing throughout the season, we keep track of number of observations per month. All right, well, I think we got two out of three videos there. Apologize for the difficulties, everyone. Uh, if anyone wants more details on that experience builder, the first video, feel free to reach out to us. You know, we're getting into the weeds a little bit here, but uh, one of our main goals of this presentation was to kind of dig down into how we're managing data. It's a lot of data and how that's informing decision making. So hopefully it will spur some ideas for you all who are considering or already doing bullfrog work. So just a couple final slides here to close out what we're seeing with spotted frogs so far. This is a map, heat map from 2020. And the main thing I wanna highlight here is if you can hopefully see a cursor, my highlighters doesn't seem to be working, but along the stretch, the diagonal line in the upper right, that's Outlet Creek. You can see some observations there of spotted frogs in 2020. So we started control work in 2021. You can see frogs expanding quite a bit in Outlet Creek spotted frogs and also popping up in some other areas. And in 2022, even further filling out that Creek, which is where we've had uh, our main perennial water source for the last five years, uh, to the point where there are frogs along a whole spotted frogs that is along a, about four mile stretch of Outlet Creek. So encouraging results there and our number of spotted frog observations have increased each of the three years so far. Similarly, if we look at uh, Oregon spotted frog Breeding, this is a map showing egg mass surveys in 2021. White dots represent mass locations. I know that's probably somewhat hard to see, but in the circled area there, you see very few egg masses in that same section uh, of Outlet Creek I highlighted on the previous slides. But with a lot of bullfrog work done in the 2021 field season, in 2022, we're seeing breeding return to those breeding locations in that area. So encouraging results as far as we're going to spotted frog breeding as well. And we're anxious to see results from this spring. We'll start the Oregon spotted frog egg mass surveys uh, within the next few weeks. And so we're encouraged that hopefully as we remove bullfrogs, we're, we're definitely decreasing the predation of Oregon spotted frogs. I don't think I mentioned that we have done long-term diet studies in partnership with Kyle Tidwell at Portland State University and confirmed, you know, Oregon spotted frogs uh, are a percentage of the bullfrog diet at Convoy Lake. So reducing that predation has been key, we think, to what we're seeing so far, and uh, we're encouraged with results so far. So with that, just a quick slide and looking forward here, some work we're doing. We're working with our statistician to try to do some population modeling of bullfrogs to look at that depletion through time. As we remove bullfrogs, uh, we now have a much better handle on where all the bullfrog breeding is happening in the valley and are able to better target that moving forward. Uh, we're doing well with getting access to private lands and those relationships and continue to work on that at a few key remaining sites and then continue the work that uh, Robin is doing in coordination with our inventory and monitoring team to work on these dashboards that have been really so far a really nice way for us to look at data in real time instead of only month by month or after the year. Uh, so it really has been informing what we're doing. And with that, I think uh, we'll leave it on the contact information slide here if anyone would like to reach out to us and uh, hopefully we've left a little time for any questions there might be appreciate to uh, you listening to what we're doing awesome thank you so much trevor and robin there are 
quite a few questions uh, that I've been kind of logging, following along in the chat. So I'll kind of kick us off on those. And, you know, folks, if I if I read out your question and you want to add anything onto that, please definitely just unmute um, and, and add whatever context feels appropriate. The first question we had was from Rob Grasso, and it was, do you focus on egg mass removal at all? And if so, when do you typically find eggs? Yes, we do. Go, go ahead and answer that one, Robin. Okay. Yeah, we definitely do. Um, it has, the egg mass stage has become more focused uh, across the years. So in 2020, it was pretty opportunistic. If we came across one while we were hunting bullfrogs, we would remove it, but we weren't actively looking for them uh, for much of the time the crew was out. But in 2021 and 2022, uh, we started to focus on that stage more. And we did so because after 2020, we had a good idea of where bullfrog breeding populations were. And we really found it an effective method to, while we were targeting adults in the breeding season, to really cover those units very thoroughly because those were the most likely units to have egg masses. And we didn't mention it in this presentation, but in 2021, we also received funding to work with, and I think this was another question in the chat, um, to work with conservation canines, uh, which was a novel, uh, kind of a novel project, but uh, we worked with one handler and one canine who came out to the refuge uh, I if I remember correctly, two times in 2021 and three times last season. And we developed a method to try to use the dog and the handler to search for egg masses by scent. And then if they, if any were found, uh, the crew would come in and actually remove them. Very cool. Thank you. Great. Okay, the next question I see here is from Will Healy. Uh, hand capture seems effective, which is a bit of a surprise. We can't get close enough to capture adult bullfrogs. Uh, they escape underwater before we can get close enough. Air rifles work best for us. Can you explain the hand capture methods a bit more? And do you need to use a boat in the large lake? Yeah, I'll let you take that one again, Robin, except for um, the large lake is pretty deep. And so we we use um, basically uh, kind of like canoes. They're for duck hunting, but uh, a wider base canoe type set. So we do do some work from the water um, at that site. A lot of other places, it's more restricted to linear features. But um, Robin, you can go ahead and explain a little more detail about when and where and why we do the hand capture and why that's successful. Sure. Um, yeah, so I think across all years, hand capture has been, I mean, yeah, very successful for us. I wouldn't, as I mentioned in one of the earlier slides, it's not the most effective method for adults. It's, it's the most effective method for juveniles and surface active metamorphs. We do largely use the air rifles to for adult removal, um, but how we actually do it is by spotlighting. So a lot of the units we're able to wait in um, and walk around in, uh, but we do use the canoes for that large pond as well as some of the deeper linear ditches. Um, but yeah, we just walk slowly or you know, paddle very slowly and um, the spotlighting has always worked effectively to kind of stun the an individual frog and I would say we get within a few feet of it and uh, with the light trained on it the entire time and are able to grab them pretty easily. Uh, we've definitely noticed that the juveniles and metamorphs are are not as dippy uh, they're, then they don't seem to learn as fast as the adults, uh, what's going on. <laughs> so they've every year, they've been pretty easy to catch by hand. 
And I've also read, and I think our experience supports this, but it seems coming from the water side is more effective than from the land where they maybe can feel the vibrations and, and take off sooner if they're near the bank. So typically we're already in the water. Yeah. Interesting. Great. Yeah, Will, I had a similar question. So thanks for asking that. The next two um, things I saw in the chat were actually more kind of comments from Bradford Norman. Uh, they're both from California, actually. Bradford Norman was saying that in Northern California, the eggs laid April through June, but are on water surface for only about five days. And then they would sink and hatch underwater. And the tadpoles are pretty small and hard to find until they're about five to six months old or larger. So kind of some comments related back to seasonality and what yeah. removal methods are the most effective. We're um, we're skewed a little higher elevation. So the earliest we've found a mass is June 1st um, and, and typically later than that. So shifted later in the field season, but same thing. You only have a few days and they're, they're very hard to detect. And so the idea that you're going to be able to sweep an area the size of ours and find all the egg masses is is not realistic. So we we focus on the key breeding sites we know about, and then also that's why we have a strong focus on removing adults to remove the breeding population. So trying to squeeze it from both sides, but especially from the removal of the adult side. Great. Yeah. And Jeff Wilcox was similarly saying that in the coast range of California, they've seen eggs between February and October kind of peaking May through June. So still a little bit behind kind of Trevor, what you mentioned there for what you all are seeing up in Washington. Yeah. And we have about a roughly a three month window, even shorter than that a little bit sometimes where we, where we see breeding. So we do have somewhat of an advantage that way, as opposed to warmer lower elevation sites where the breeding season is, is much extended. Awesome. Carly Wickham um, wanted to know, I'm not sure if you all actually mentioned this in the presentation, but was hoping that you could remind them how you are euthanizing the frogs. Yeah, it's a combination. I mean, a lot of frogs are shot, bigger frogs shot with air rifle. Um, if we are gigging frogs and we're trying to euthanize them right with the sharp blow and then uh, frogs back in the lab, because of the volume of frogs we're getting, uh, we can't use chemicals on that number of frog, thousands of frogs. And so we've gone with a, um, it, it's in the literature. I can, anyone interested, I can send you uh, references of folks have been using this, but there's a, a two-step method for freezing frogs that we've used for when we have, you know, thousands of frogs as opposed to handfuls where we can use more specialized methods. Okay, Megan Cook actually had a couple questions here. I'll start with the first, um, which is, is there any community outreach associated with this effort so folks don't end up releasing bullfrogs in the area in the future? Yeah, several things. Robin's been pretty involved with that. If you want to speak to that, Robin. Sure. Yeah. Um, so community outreach was pretty limited in 2020 and even 2021 just because of COVID. Um, so we really started uh, branching out uh, last year in terms of public talks, public outreach. So we had two major events last year that were pretty successful. We uh, went to the local school um, and to a biology class and did a little presentation on uh, sp spotted frogs and bullfrogs in the valley and talking about both of those to the elementary high school biology class. And then the Mount Adams resource stewards held a community uh, pig roast uh, of which we served 250 bullfrog legs to the community and we didn't have any leftover. <laughs> so people <laughs> actually ate them, which was very cool and liked them. <laughs> so we got everybody from local ranchers to, uh, you know, Portlanders coming out to this pig roast and all getting together and 
uh, we also presented, you know, had a little poster going of the work that we're doing with the bullfrog removal in the valley. So that was very successful as well. Uh, and besides that, which we hope to continue to, to do those community outreach events and expand on those moving forward, um, since 2020, uh, we have been actively reaching out to private landowners across the refuge, particularly landowners that have ponds or ditches that connect to refuge uh, waters to establish relationships with those folks and uh, try to ultimately gain access to those properties so we can connect, conduct bullfrog removal there as well. Awesome, that's helpful, Robin. And that ties into a question from Sarah Woods, which was just, are you addressing bullfrog control on adjacent private land? And so it sounds like the answer is yes. Um, and there's some ways that you're going about it. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, let's see, Will Keeley asked, how do you define a site? It looks like some sites are well within the movement potential of organ spotted frog and thus defining each site as independent might be difficult. Yeah, that's definitely true. No, the sites aren't independent. Uh, basically, we have them split up in a way where we can effectively send the crew to certain places or within a stream or within a ditch. You know, we know segments where bullfrogs tend to congregate. And so it's definitely correct. If we're looking at it statistically, we can't call the sites independent, but it is very helpful to break it up that way to efficiently have our crew go where they need to go. There are a couple folks in the comments. I know we're getting close to the top of the hour here. We do still have a few comments left, um, but some people are curious if we would be able to share a copy of the slides and or the videos. So maybe Trevor and Robin, we can connect on that and see if this is available to share more broadly. We can we can do that. The uh, the videos make it a pretty large file, so you have to get creative. But uh, we'll work with you, Carly, to figure out whatever works best. Okay, wonderful. Um, okay, well then to keep us rolling, um, Blair Smith asked, "When you drained Mill Pond, was there a concern for other aquatic species?" Yeah. So really, um, there were. There, there is some water left in the site. There's some deeper ponding that remains. Um, so there was a place for species to go, but really, um, especially with spotted frogs, they're not using uh, that reservoir. Um, we've been three years, we've documented, I think one spotted frog uh, within that channel. And historically it's been drawn down uh, quite often anyways at different times for vegetation control or other reasons. It's been drawn down other times a year before uh, to mitigate flooding issues with adjacent landowners. And so this wasn't something new um, that's happened repeatedly at that site. The changes, um, the timing and working with our the partner to do it at a time where we thought we could maximize uh, the bullfrog removal. Uh, one of the, so I have three more questions here. I know that it is the top of the hour, so if folks need to jet off. Um, yeah, please feel free to do so, but I do want to get these questions answered. Trevor and Robin, do you have maybe another five minutes to stay on here? Yep, no problem. Yeah. Great. Um, Chris asked, do you know what proportion of bullfrog diet is actually organ spotted frog? And then a follow up would be what life stage? Yeah, that's pretty difficult to answer. We really, as far as life stage, we haven't done any uh, DNA analysis on it, only what uh, you can see visually. And so we're looking typically at larger spotted frogs uh, detected in the diet. And then I can't really speak to the percentage because there's a large percentage. We can designate by species, but sometimes it's just you know, we know it's a frog or Portland State knows it's a frog, but as far as whether it's a chorus frog or a spotted frog, hard to detect. Um, the primary diet component of bullfrogs at Conway Lake is still 
invertebrates, uh, particularly large diving beetles. But uh, um, off the top of my head, I can't remember overall the vertebrate component, but there's a certain size cutoff where bullfrogs smaller than that aren't consuming me many vertebrates. So we're talking about mostly adult bullfrogs. And I'm sorry, I don't want to give you bad information. I'd have to look up proportion that we can confirm our organ spotted frogs. But within the, the vertebrate category of diets, um, it's a noticeable component. It's not, it's not a, a rare thing. And uh, feel free to reach out if you want more details. I can, I can look them up for you. Awesome. Um, Ryan Borke actually has a question um, that is, would you be willing to share a blank copy of your field maps geo database with other entities trying to get a bullfrog removal project off the ground? Um, and they gave some some kudos there. Not sure maybe the best way would be for Ryan to take down contact information there and reach out and, and y'all can see if that's a possibility. Yeah, that'd be the best. We've got some layers that are specific to only accessible to fish and wildlife folks. So there'd be there'd be things to work out. But we have talked about, you know, with state partners and others, you know, being able to to share what we can. So we'd be happy to talk about that. And um, our inventory and monitoring team of Fish and Wildlife Service has has been a huge help with that. And um, they'd be the people to connect with too and and see what might work. Awesome. Ryan, I see you're still in the Zoom meeting, so please feel free to contact Trevor and Robin and y'all can, can work that out. Um, that's great. And then the last question I have here um, is from Ryan Peak, and it's, has there been any effort or thought on using genetic sampling of bullfrogs to estimate genetic population size and effective number of breeders to get a sense for how that correlates with your removal numbers, i.e., if you start to see shifts in the genetic data that could match census slash field observations. Yeah, that's a good thought. Not really, that'd be something good to consider. We are doing some genetic work uh, in combination with a larger study across the region uh, with spotted frogs and what's going on with that population. Uh, we are doing, we didn't mention it in this uh, talk, but there is a large biosurveillance component of this project we're doing with U.S. Geological Survey, doing both eDNA work and acoustics work using, using audio moths. So we are collecting eDNA on bullfrogs. Uh, as far as looking at uh, the population structure, though, we haven't thought of using it that way, so that's an interesting thought. Great. Well, there's a lot of um, thanks and appreciation being shared in the comments. And we are about four minutes over, but are still 65 folks strong. So thanks everyone for hanging in with us to get to the end there. Um, just wanted to do a quick wrap up here, but thanks everyone for taking the time to join us. This webinar was recorded and we will make it available on our YouTube channel for folks who want to rewatch any part of it. Um, you can find all of our other previous webinars there as well. Our next webinar is on March 15th, and this one's going to be with Debbie Deshawn and Matthew Barnes from Muscle Dogs, um, who will be speaking about quagga and zebra muscle detection using canines. So if the conversation today piqued your interest about detection dogs, um, definitely tune in on March 15th for our next webinar. Um, and thank you all so much for your time. Thank you again, Trevor and Robin, for joining us to give this excellent presentation. Um, hope to see everyone again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.